Good morning. Um, thanks for waking up and showing up here. Um, I'm Steve Hastings, and this is Put Those CPU Cores to Work. Um, and we have a couple more people trickling in. I'll just maybe give it one moment. So, um, when I give talks, I try to provide speaker notes in the slide deck so that when you just download the slide deck, you'll get um, a little more than just the slides. On this talk, it's not as good as like my other talks, perhaps, but it's there. And uh, um, also, I haven't actually uploaded this slide deck yet. I was up a little bit late last night, still finishing the slides. Um, but before the end of today, I will have this slide deck uploaded to that location. So let's get going. Um, modern processors have a lot of processor cores. And what exactly is a processor core? Simply, it's the part of the processor that does all the work. Um, you can break it down even further into the integer unit, the floating point unit, instruction decode, you know, various things. But basically, what I'm, when I say processor core, I mean everything that does work and not the cache. Modern chips have so much cache that the core is relatively small. And um, around you know, the early 2000s, they started looking really seriously at uh, putting multiple processing cores. Um, and each core is going to have its own level 1 cache and maybe even level 2 cache. But like level th key 3 cache is going to be shared by all the cores on your chip. Um, so I, I looked on the internet, and around 2004 is when the dual core processors started shipping. And that doesn't seem like that long ago to me, but now we're up to um, crazy. Um, four cores is common. Um, AMD just shipped the Ryzen chips, and those are eight cores. Uh, rumor has it AMD is going to be shipping 16 core Ryzen's, and they'll be pretty affordable. If you've got lots of money, Intel has chips with 20 cores for like five grand each in the Xeon line. So you can get a lot of cores. Um, and most of us with like a quad core desktop maybe aren't putting all the cores to work. I think if you're spending five grand on that one Xeon chip, you probably already have an idea on how to put it to work. Um, so in the early dawn of Linux and Unix, all the computers all only had really one core. So having the, the number of cores doesn't really control how many programs you can run at once. Um, you can make one core pretend to be several with time slicing. You run one task for a while, do a context switch, switch to another task, let that run for a while. And it used to be there would be one core for like two dozen, three dozen users on one mini computer. Um, so now we have a slightly better core to person ratio, like several cores per person instead of one core shared among dozens of people. Um, when we talk about the jobs that you can run on a core, you talk about I.O. bound versus processor bound. The I.O. bound ones wait all the time for disk or whatever, disk internet perhaps, um, and you can run a whole lot of I.O. bound jobs on one core and it's fine. But there are processor bound jobs where just the CPU is working very hard and then the more cores you can throw at the problem, the better. Um, So um, I'm giving this talk on a laptop that has uh, a dual core processor, but Intel claims that it's almost as good as four cores because of hyperthreading. Um, hyperthreading is a feature where um, the chip basically tells the OS that it has twice as many cores as it does. And the cores have extra processing units on board, maybe some extra integer math units. For some workloads, it works almost as well as double the cores. My examples that I'm going to show you with MP3 encoding, it doesn't work. It, 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 when, you, when, when we use all that we can use, the tasks speed up by roughly double. So we're not getting 4x performance out of my processor, even though it advertises that it has four cores. Um, and by the way, uh, AMD didn't ever have anything they called uh, hyperthreading, but they did for a while ship a chip architecture called Bulldozer, which only had 
one floating point unit per two cores. So you could get an eight core bulldozer um, and for MP3 encoding, it would only act like it had four cores. So what exactly a core is, is a little bit fuzzy depending on hyperthreading, how many FPUs, whatever. Um, so sometimes all you can do is try, see how many things you can run at once and see what actually happens to your performance. Um, Multi-core for the win. Um, Multi-cores are not going away. We're only going to get more. Um, I was looking for interesting quotes to share with you guys, and I found a, a wonderful quote from uh, Seymour Cray. He was not a believer in multi-cores. The quote was, if you wanted to plow your field, which would you rather have, two strong <laughs> oxen or 1,024 chickens? Um, but these days, it's like you're going to buy a chip and it's going to have four or eight strong oxen, you know. So, um, and um, his thinking was he wanted to take just one core but make it the fastest core you could ever make. But um, that has been outstripped by reality. Um, by throwing multiple cores or even multiple whole computers at a problem, um, we can get much more performance. So um, enough uh, rambling about theory. Let's start getting down to specifics. Um, for examples in this talk, I'm using MP3 encoding. And that's partly to celebrate the fact that MP3, the patents have all expired. So now um, you go to the mp3licensing.com webpage, and it's just like, go away. It's over. All the patents. They're, they're done. So um, all the Linux distributions are all going to have uh, MP3 full support from now on because there's no reason not to. Um, and in order to give me something to run for you guys, I wrote uh, a script that with the idea called MP3 Sync. My, I, I have a lot of CDs, and I rip them to FLAC because FLAC is lossless. Um, hard disks are big. There's no reason to rip to MP3 anymore. Um, so I ripped to the lossless FLAC, but I want to have a sync process that um, will make a copy of the FLAC but transform to MP3. And so um, that's a nice thing for demos. Um, and um, I wrote two versions of it. The first version of it Well, okay, here's how, here, I, this slide talks about how, how, how you call it. So we're going to specify the directory where the FLAC files live, and we're going to specify a directory where we want the MP3 <laughs> files to live. And then the third argument is a specific subdirectory to do the sync on. And it'll create that subdirectory, corresponding subdirectory, in the MP3 tree, if it doesn't exist, and then encode all the files. It would have been easier to just make a script that just took a FLAC file and then encoded it to an MP3 file, but I wanted the convenience that it would automatically create the directories and things like that. So um, here is a bare bones shell version of it. Um, and this is basically going to work. I think it's kind of ugly, um, and it actually has a bug in it. This will work great as long as you only run one instance of it. But if you run multiple instances of it, there's a temp file. And all of, the, all of the multiple instances are going to try to write to the same temp file, which isn't going to work well at all. Um, in theory, by the way, we should be able to just use a, 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 uni, a Linux pipe and pipe the output of uh, FLAC-D to decode the FLAC into the lame MP3 encoder. But when I tried it, the lame MP3 encoder gave me all kinds of weird errors and warnings. And I just said, forget it. I'm doing a temp file because I just want it to work. So um, we can make a simple change. And the simple change is to change the name of the temp file to include dollar dollar. Dollar dollar is a special uh, variable that the shell provides that expands to the current process ID number. So this is an old trick. When you want to write a, a shell script that writes a temp file, 
and you want to be able to run multiple instances of it, as long as they're all in different processes, which they will, there's nobody does multi-threaded shell scripts. Um, so as long as they're in different processes, the temp files will be unique because um, they will have the process ID in them. Um, but I'm kind of a Python guy, and I think Python is much nicer. Um, here is the bare bones, just the, the middle part of a Python version of MP3 sync, which is what I'm going to run in my demos. Um, and um, with this one, I made a uh, there's a with statement here, and it calls with temp f name. That's going to create a temp file, and then when you exit from the with block, it will clean that up, no matter how you exit. If, if you get taken down by a, a, somebody hits control C or somebody kills the process, it will still clean up the temp file on the way out. Um, and there's other good things about Python. but um, So all this, the MP3 sync, both versions, um, and all the code I'm going to show you is going to be shared on the internet with a BSD license so you can do whatever you want with it. But again, I haven't uploaded the talk yet, I haven't uploaded the source code yet, but I'll get that uploaded today. And I'll either upload them together to the same place or I'll edit the, uh, the slide deck to say where to find the code, whichever way. So for our first multi making the cores work, there's a cheap and obvious trick that you can just open multiple terminal shells and run your script from each one. Um, because when you run your GUI desktop, um, each terminal shell you get is going to, when you run things in it, it's going to be in its own process. Um, and in fact, if you have a multi-tab terminal, each tab is going to be running things in its own process. Um, so it's really a pretty cheap trick. Uh, it's not doing very much for you, but if you just had like three directories where you wanted to run make or something like that, and you wanted to get them all going at once, uh, that would be a way you can do it. Um, still cheap, but slightly more interesting would be the shell job control features. Um, there was a time not that long ago when the typical use case for computers was you would have one person sitting in front of like a dumb terminal and doing all their work from that dumb terminal. We didn't even necessarily have things like tmux yet um, to, uh, to, to make the one act like many. Uh, so there's this really rich and probably mostly forgotten by now set of commands for managing jobs um, called job control features. And if you read the bash web page, you can read about these. Um, so <coughs> Here, I'm, I've got a terminal emulator, and I'm running the VI editor on one of my examples. If I hit Control Z, I've just stopped VI, but I haven't quit it. It's still running. It's still available. And you'll notice that it says, in, in, bra in square braces, it says 1. If I say jobs, I'll get a list of the jobs that the shell is tracking for me. And that looks redundant. It just looks like the same thing. I only have one job being trapped, tracked. The one job is in a stopped state. Um, I've got the microphone for talking to you guys and the microphone for recording. This one doesn't help me talk to you guys. This one doesn't help with recording. So I kind of need both, but only one of them. We can hear you without your microphone. Great. I'll just put this thing down. All right. Um,
Okay, so I wanted to run a command to show the, the computer be getting busy, and um, it ran instantly because I actually have been running this over and over, and the files are already there. So let's clean the files up, and then run that demo again. All right, it's now running the MP3 encoder um, just with one processor core. Now, on this laptop, in the lower right corner of my desktop, I have um, the, the GNOME system monitor. And it's showing you right now how busy the system is. Black is idle, purple is user processes, white is system processes, and there's a couple other colors that show up sometimes. Um, so really, this computer has got one of its two cores busy. But since it's got hyperthreading and it advertises that there's four cores, what you see is that about one quarter of the graph is colored in with the purple. Um, so it's working away. Now, I just suspended that job. And now when I type jobs, you can see that I have two of them. I could run something else. Um, I can run a big LS job. And I'll start this one in the background. This is part of the job control history. When you, when you specify an ampersand on the end, um, it means instead of running it in the foreground, it runs it in the background. And what that means is um, control is returned to your shell immediately, and the process is running, and the shell tracks it with the job control features. So let's do this. Notice standard error is still forwarded to my terminal, so that's kind of helpful. But if we look at jobs, if we try to look at jobs, all right, this demo again. Um, Using, using the, the wonderful shell syntax, I'm sending the standard output from ls to dev null, and then I'm sending stream 2, the error stream, to the same place that stream 1 is going. So hopefully it will not spew all the errors on the screen this time. Um, so now you can see we have, well, because I ran it and, the, and this is not actually a very time consuming task, um, it's already done. Anyway, you can see from the job control, we had three things going. Now when we say jobs, it only has the two things. And I can say percent two and restart job two in the foreground again. And it was almost done anyway. Um, So I've started this one. I'm going to suspend it. And now when I, when I check it, we have our list of jobs. And now I can say, run this job in the background. And now when we check on it, job two is running. So um, you'll notice from the, C, the, the system monitor that um, the, the processor is, is working away. And now, um, now I have two jobs running in the background. Two of them are MP3 syncs, and you'll notice another increment of use on the CPU graph. Um, so this, when I, when I was at uh, um, university, I did a lot of this. Um, I was using a shared computer with a bunch of other people, which dates me. You can now tell how old I am. Um, and uh, it would take 
three to five minutes to compile a Pascal program that I was doing for homework. And so I would be compiling things in the background and editing things in the foreground and using these job control features to juggle things all the time. These days, again, not as big a deal, but you might find a use for this, and, and it's kind of cool. There's this whole history, you know, if you read the man, bash, the man page for Bash, you can read about these features. Um, so you'll notice one of them must have finished, if you look at the CPU graph, it's the second one, and the third one will finish up soon enough. I run the CPU graph all the time. I can tell at a glance how my system's doing, although usually it's solid purple because I run web browsers, and modern web browsers, they, they have to run all your JavaScript on all your tabs, and so they, they can like hammer all your cores. Um, but it's nice to be able to tell at a glance how busy your system is, and I, I like having that graph. So enough of these job control tricks. Let's move on. So make, make is a program that we run to uh, compile stuff. Um, make. The, the primary purpose of it is to figure out what things need to be built and build them for you. But somebody decided to add features to make to run multiple instances, um, and that's very useful if you have a multi-core system. The dash J option controls how many instances of make to run. And there's a, a rule of thumb that uh, if you have, say, four cores, you should run make-j5. It's just number of cores plus one. So I was wondering, could I abuse make to just run my MP3 encoder? And the answer is, yes, I can. And it was a pain, and I did it for you because I care so much. <laughs> but you guys aren't going to want to do it. But nonetheless, um, I wanted to give you examples of keeping your cores busy. Here is a quick mini make file that does a few of my, my directories here. So the dot dummy make target tells make we're just tricking you into doing some work. Um, it's okay that nothing gets created in response to running this rule. Um, and then the rule, the dependencies are the source, no see, the dependencies are the, the, the destination directories, the mp3 directories. Um, and then the dependency rule says to run the, the mp3 sync program with the dash v option that shows the output um, and specifies the, the arguments. So I'm going to give you the demo now. Before I do, I haven't been running with, with dash V, but I'll show you. When you run it with dash V, it gives you verbose output to help you figure out what it's doing. So in this case, it's going to just say um, skipping everything because it's already been done. So I wanted the MP3 sync to be a cheap operation. It will walk through your whole tree, um, and any directory that's already been encoded to MP3, just it just goes skipping, and uh, so as you rip new albums, you could just run your whole MP3 sync thing, and it'll just MP3 whichever ones you need done. Anyway, let's run make. All right, I'm going to run it without the dash J. And so you can see by the CPU graph that um, it's just got one core going. So now let's skip that and say make dash J. Four. Now, because I've got the verbose output turned on, you can see that stuff is running all at the same time. The output lines are being interleaved here. Um, we got Genesis, we got Star Wars, we got stuff encoding. Um, make it's all about running your compile for you, and it's not really about managing standard output and trying to un keep things uninterleaved. So it's working. Um, but this is probably not the best way to solve the problem. 
So when I went to write this talk, um, I did a check to see what tools there might be, and I found out about a tool that I had never heard of. And the tool is called GNU Parallel. And um, I read that the very first version of GNU Parallel actually used this stupid trick. It would write a cheap make file like this and then just run make-j to get the multi-core. Um, but GNU Parallel is now a project and it's a thing with a whole bunch of features and it does its own management of uh, processing. So let's stop this. So the, the basic idea with GNU Parallel is you pipe the work in. So in this case, we're going to pipe in the list of directories that we want to sync. Um, and we could make this list of directories, for example, with the find command. Um, so here is the command line for running um, GNU Parallel. Um, we're going to use the find command and just find directories. That's dash type D and save it in a dirs.txt file. Then we run GNU parallel and give it the command line to run. And finally, we, we give it the first the first arguments, but we leave out the last argument and then we say less than the, the dirs. We could actually do it in one line with a pipe if we wanted. Um, but we pipe the we, we provide the, 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 the work on standard input and then it's going to run. What was that? Oh, I just created a new music folder. <laughs> well, it's a it's a good thing that uh, the pro the, uh, the the sync script is robust enough that it'll uh, create that for me instead of crashing. That would have been a Oh, never mind. It doesn't matter. It's running. Um, so by default, GNU Parallel detects how many CPU cores you have in your system and runs that many instances. So it's running four instances of the MP3 uh, sync script. Um, and in fact, um, let's clean this up. First of all, I wanted to say dash V to show you the verbose output. There. Thank you. Um, one of the nice things that Parallel does for you is that it captures all of the uh, output of the application uh, and presents it to you in a non-interleaved way. So as the scripts finish, we should start seeing the output from parallel all in, in one whack. It's like, here's the output from this invocation of the script any day now. Um, with the, uh, the little subset of my music collection that I put on here for this demo, running it on one core takes about seven to eight minutes, and running it on two cores takes about half that long. And running it on four cores also takes about half that long. So um, this whole thing should be able to finish in less than four minutes. Maybe, maybe it doesn't print anything until it's done, and then it dumps it all. I'll leave that running and talk some more instead of just standing here. Now, so far, starting with cheap tricks and then moving on up to GNU Parallel, which is pretty slick. I like Parallel. Um, if, you, if you use um, Ubuntu or Debian, you can just say apt get, um, I, think, 
I think it's it's either I don't remember the package name, but it's parallel or GNU parallel, one of those. Parallel. It is just parallel. Okay, um, so it's easy to get it, and it it's useful. Um, also, um, I'm not going to go into it here, but GNU Parallel has features for uh, running your tasks on other computers. If you, have, if you have multiple computers, you can have it send work over, run the work on the other computers, and get the result back. But everything I've shown you so far has just been about running some kind of a script. The, M the MP3 sync script has this nice property that all it does is it writes files onto the disk and then it's done. So we don't really need a two-way communication with it. We just need to know that it succeeded or that it failed. Um, but we can improve our abstraction a bit and give us a way to think about this. Um, and with the better abstraction, we can solve more problems. So let's, instead of having our workers just do something, let's, let's assume that they are going to apply a function. So we're going to send some kind of a piece of data over some kind of a function is going to run, and then some kind of a result will be sent back. Now, if all you want is the work like MP3 encoding, then you could just send like the empty string back or something like that and not care about this aspect of it, and it's still good. You can still do things with this improved abstraction, but now you can solve new problems. Um, and furthermore, now that we're getting data back from, from the functions, what will we do with the data? We need to have some kind of a master function that collects the data and does something with it. And again, for something simple like MP3 encoding, maybe all we do is just throw it away. We don't need it. We don't care about it. We're just getting back the empty string anyway. But we could be getting back arbitrary data pro processed on the, uh, on the other things. We can do arbitrary, like some kind of combining. Um, so functional programming, they, they thought a lot about um, the high level, like what can we do with functions, and they came up with this, this idea of map and fold. Fold is also called reduce. Um, so map is you, you have a function, you give it data, and it maps the function onto the data and sends you back the result. Fold takes multiple values and outputs a single value. Again, that's also called reduce. So an example of a, a, a reduce function would be addition. You give addition two numbers, and it gives you back one number. Another example would be string concatenation. You give the string concatenate function two strings, and it gives you back one string. Um, another simple one would be collecting in a list. You give something a list and a value, and it gives you back a new list that has that value appended onto it. So um, the general concept of a reduce is you have some kind of accumulator, and you send it values one by one, and it returns an updated version of the accumulator, like in the case of addition, a new integer or a new floating point, whatever. Or in the case of a list, the list has now been, been lengthened by having one thing added to it. Um, so once we have map and reduce, we can start thinking about um, how to apply this. And Python provides a built-in thing which allows you to run on multiple processes, which is suitable for putting cores to work. So Python has a built-in module called multiprocessing, and that has a class called pool, and pool has a, f a method function called map. And the pool map is what I'm going to put to work here. I've been using this for years because it has some really nice properties. Uh, like make-j or like uh, GNU parallels, it will, it will make as much parallel processing as your machine can handle. It will, it will detect how many cores you have and default to that many. But you can tell it a different number if you want. And for highly I.O. bound jobs, I've, I routinely run programs that run 30 worker processes. They spend most of their time waiting for the internet anyway, and so one machine can easily handle 30 processes all hitting HTTP requests against servers. Um, so here is a nice simple example. Um, 
This is going to do sum of squares with pool.math. Um, we have some kind of a list of numbers. We have a square function, which is just going to multiply the number by itself. And when we run this code, it's going to make a pool, which will automatically have one worker per processing core. It's going to call the map function, which will apply the SQR function onto each value from the data. And the result of this will be a Python iterator that if you iterate it, well, okay, we called the we actually called the dot map function, so I think it's actually going to be a list. Uh, anyway, you'll get a list of results, and we can then pass that to sum, and sum will reduce that down to a single number. And this does sum of squares. Now, sum of squares, we're actually doing more work by farming this out to different processes than it would be to just square the numbers in the same process. So I'm asking you to work with me here and imagine that instead of SQR being a trivial function, it's something like computing a, a galaxy simulation of interaction of stars and gravity or something, some really big calculation that would be totally worth shipping out to the different processes. Um, but this is a correct and working program that you can run on Python, and um, it shows how easy it is to get started. And again, you don't have to really manage this. It detects how many cores you have. If you run it on a two-core machine, it'll run two. If you run it on a four-core machine, it'll run four. It's all, it's really slick. It's not perfect, though. If you have an exception from your code in any of the processes, the whole thing goes pear-shaped. So um, it just doesn't handle errors at all. But of course, Python has exception handling, and you could catch all the errors. And um, what I had wanted for years and never realized that I wanted was a framework that would automatically set up one of these map pools and catch all the exceptions in all the workers and just manage all that for me. So I wrote that, and I'm going to release that as a, an open source project with, again, a friendly license so you can do whatever you want with it. Um, the other thing is, in order to uh, figure out what, what's going on if something goes wrong, you want to have some kind of logging. And the best thing you want is for the logging to just collect all the logging for one instance and then ship the log file, the log data back with the result of the calculation. So that's how this works. So I called this MRPool, which I'm pronouncing Mr. Pool. So that's the MapReduce pool. And it's really, it's just not a, not a lot of Python. And it's not the hardest thing ever. But um, I needed it for years without ever inventing it. So I'm hoping that uh, now that I'm sharing it with the world that other people will benefit from it. Um, so let's, we're returning here to this. And as we can see, all of the output from Parallel, remember I left Parallel running and started, started talking instead of making you wait for it. You can see that all of the output from, from Parallel is all nicely ordered. It's not interleaved and messy like it was with, uh, with Make. And um, in fact, the, the input file, the durlist.txt, had the directory names in alphabetical order. And uh, you can see that the output, it's in the order. It's, this is exactly what you would see if you had just run the job on one core. Um, so it's all packaged up and shipped back to you. So if you don't need the full power of MapReduce, um, Parallels is a nice way to go. And it's really easy to get started with it. Anyway. Uh, All right. That was really fast because I'd already done the work and it just saw that all the files were created. So we'll delete the files and we'll run it again. So um, this is just this is using Mr. Pool to run the stuff. Um, it's automatically running on the number of cores that the system has, which is advertised before. 
But uh, like I told you, if we actually time this, we'll see that it only speeds up by about 2x. It doesn't speed up by a full 4x. Yeah, I did the sum of squares example with Mr. Pool. So um, we're providing a map function, which is square. It just returns x times x. And we're, we're providing some kind of a reduce function, which is add. Um, and so this will automatically run on a bunch of uh, cores. So Mr. Pool is relatively simple and it's one source file in Python, and all you need is a standard install of Python to run it. But it only runs on one machine. The idea of MapReduce, Google did it first, I think. Um, they realized that you could get any number of computers involved. Instead of sending the data to a different process, you'd send it over, like the network, to a different computer. Um, and so Google makes heavy use of MapReduce. And when you do a search on Google, dozens to hundreds of Google servers are involved in that search in a split second. Um, so MapReduce, I was talking in terms of like computing a function or doing work like MP3 encoding, but another thing you can obviously do is you could have a very large index, let's say an index of the entire internet, that is so large that it would overwhelm even the disk storage of, of any single computer. So you'd give dozens to hundreds of computers each their own part of the index of the entire internet. And you could send the search query, fan it out to all these computers with as like a map operation. And then they all send back what they have on that search query. And a lot of them will have nothing. Like this, this computer over here has the part of the internet devoted to celebrities. And you're looking for stuff about programming. So you get nothing from the celebrities. Um, but this other server maybe gets a bunch. So the search results all get sent back from the map jobs and then the reduce job collects it and formats it into something that's useful for you and displays it to you all in a split second. So Google has not shared this because it's like their secret sauce, but they, they wrote a very nice white paper that explained what they were doing and why it was cool. And then um, a lot of people read that white paper and said, I could do that. And so, so that's kind of where Apache Hadoop came from. Apache Hadoop was somebody explicitly read the, the Google white paper and said, I'm going to do MapReduce like Google. And he named it Hadoop after a little toy elephant. Um, but uh, Hadoop is a big, powerful framework that is used by a lot of companies. Um, and it runs on the JVM, uh, which is kind of a beast. I've, I've worked with the JVM and it's bitten me several times, so I'm scared of it. Um, but it is a thing if you, if you wanted to run jobs at scale. Another one which um, looks highly intriguing is called Disco. And Disco came out of Nokia. Um, and it was written in Erlang. Um, so both Hadoop and Disco have language libraries for a bunch of languages, um, including definitely Python. But um, Disco's I th it, it kind of advertises the Python bindings at the top of the Disco page. So f if you try working on Hadoop and Disco, both of them will have this idea of a map function and a reduce function. And hopefully from this talk, you've got the, the framework in, in your mind there of that. Um, so my Mr. Pool job finished and um, And my slides have finished. So I would like to uh, take any questions. MPICH? I see. She says MPICH is a project for doing MapReduce stuff. Uh, that one it's did not. Distributed. Distributed. Right. Distributed. 
I know, I know MPI is like a framework for, for distributed computing. Um, I haven't actually done a lot of distributed computing myself, but I've done a lot of running jobs across multiple cores on one computer. Um, so that's what this talk was more about. Uh, anyway, um, so that was sort of a question. Any, yes, question? It may be a good idea to look into HPC schedulers. They can schedule jobs on so multiple machines and look at their loads and, and uh, disk usage, network usage, all, all, that, all that kind of stuff. And they can account even for interactive jobs. Okay, so you're saying it's a good idea to look into HPC, HPC schedulers. schedulers. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? Are there other useful abstractions for this kind of chaining besides the functional MapReduce? The question is, are there other useful abstractions uh, than MapReduce for, for this? <coughs> Maybe there are, but I haven't heard of them. The MapReduce is really doing it for most people. Um, I mean, it's a nice general thing, like I said. If, for example, if you just wanted to do the work, you can do a reduce that just discards whatever's returned and return like basically nothing. Um, if you wanted to do like an index search, you can send back nothing if you've got nothing in your index and send back what you have. Like, there's, there's really no problem you can't tackle with this framework. Um, so I haven't heard of any other one. I mean, the GNU parallel one just has this simpler abstraction of just send something over and run it and collect any, collect any output that it sends to standard output. Um, all right, well, thank you very much for coming. Great talk. Oh, thanks. We're in luck. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. It's not up yet, but okay. it will be. Um, okay. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna see if where I put the talk, if I can put the source code there, so you can just grab okay. it. Perfect. But if you can't grab it from there, I'm gonna modify the slide deck before I upload it to say where it's gonna go. Okay. Uh, I life got busy and stuff happened, and I was finishing this talk late last night, so that's, good. that's not the best. Um, so I don't have the source code up ready. Up ready. But I wanted to like, put the Mr. Cool stuff up on like the Python package index so that I could say to hip install MR Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be nice. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Could you bring up the first slide for just a second? Sure. I didn't quite get that link. I wasn't quite ready for it. Oh, no. The first one? Or the one with the location of the slides. There we go. Yeah, there we go.
theoretically, all the talks for the various, all the slides for the various talks will be up in this site default file slides. Yeah, and then it's actually that's like a standard place to put them. I around and I just use four. Yeah, so what I like is after you you run, so for example here, uh, I go here. It's good talk. And I really yes, so MPIC so agent is an MPI implementation. The, the two popular ones are MPIC agent LAM MPI is another one. And it's kind of like, you know, like with some of the stuff you're describing, you know, it's kind of like the difference between, you know, going to Lowe's or Home Depot and buying like a playground set. Mm -hmm. And you know, so and then, you you know walking or walking you. down to lumber yeah, yeah, yeah. and picking out no, no, no. all the it pieces and walking down to hardware and picking out all the nuts and bolts and then cutting everything down to size or something. I mean, it's it's there, but it's it's for programming C and C++, and it's for developing distributed programs where you, among other things, have to implement something to manage all of the distribution and gathering everything back. So it's not, I mean, it's a library, not a framework. Right, so right, it's, right. it's you yeah, know, so very, like, comparatively line, very low level. Back. It's not and like, you know, I think like Slurm and other, you know, back scheduling back. type uh, yeah. things yeah. or like grid engine, <laughs> right? <laughs> where you can I, just, you know, drop I, jobs I, in, it'll take I, care of figuring out where to send it and collect all the kind of stuff you were talking yeah. about. MPI is, I'm going to write a program that's going to figure out how to divvy everything up, going to figure out how to farm it out, going to figure out how to execute it once it's there, going to figure out how to get the results back, going to figure out how, I mean, so you you are literally figuring out everything along the way and so, that, that's appropriate for like when you're doing like jet engine simulations exactly. and stuff and you need very you highly customized yeah exactly you need the performance and it's extremely extremely uh, customized like when I was an undergraduate um, I uh, one of the classes uh, I took a uh, graduate level software engineering class we our team we were assigned a project to help out two PhD students that were doing research on I, I don't remember exactly what the research topic was but we were tasked with developing them and application that would ingest a terrain database and that you could then feed it any two points in 3D space and you know potentially over very long distances and then we would have to calculate you know all we have to basically figure out all the line of sight obstructions along the way and it's and it's a non-trivial problem and so you know they had a they had a Linux cluster set up to do this and we had to you know write a program that would figure out for each job you know like which part of the terrain database do we need how do we divvy up that part of the terrain database farm it out to the things how do they figure out you know where there's an obstruction because you know like, if you divvy up the terrain database in such a way that um, see like like this is an obstruction here if I if I, if I you know cut it off here and my line of sight goes through here you know I have my algorithm has to account for the fact that I may not see the other side of the obstruction in a particular subset I mean so I mean high, you know high complexity and things like that like that's the kind of thing MPI is is used for so that didn't that seemed like I understand why she asked and if I guess if, if, you're, if you've never used MPI it would seem like oh I've heard of this distributed computing thing you know why are you not talking about this but it's a it's in a completely different you know space of the uh, yes. you know, of the yes. distributed yes. Uh, computing out, yes. But anyhow. So, so like you can see, I made this script MP run, yep. and it just or takes like um, the arguments, yep. so MP3 sync and then yep. Yep. the right. arguments right. there, yep. and it just fans it out. Exactly. And so this is kind of where I'm coming from. I'm a humble software developer, yep. and I'll have things like, like I remember I was working on a, a project where the unit tests took a long time. I, that's, I'm doing that on a Java project where I've got you know, unit tests that take 23 hours to run. Uh, well, yeah. it wasn't that bad, but yeah. um, <laughs> because I had four cores, it's yeah. like I was hammering one yeah. core and three yeah. cores were sitting yeah. idle. Yeah. And then I just did this little bit of Python code and yeah. and just forked off yeah. the the unit tests like in in pieces. And all yeah. of a sudden, it was it was like four x. Yeah. I'm trying to convince uh, some of the folks that are involved in this project because we it it's a project been around for a while and it uses JUnit for its job. And uh, JUnit four has the ability to you know, basically do like a thread pool. In a JUnit test class, you can say, make me a thread pool with this many threads, and it will actually um, run. So like each test class has individual test methods, and you can and, and it will basically like farm out the execution of the test method. So if you're smart about what you put in each individual test method in the larger class, 
then you know you can kind of balance those out pretty nicely, and then it'll farm it out, and you actually get a pretty pretty decent performance bump. But I haven't convinced them yet because we have probably like, like forty thousand lines of new test code, and they're kind of like, gosh, you know, we're we're scared, you know, that you know, it's supposed to have a compatibility mode, so we should be able to leave everything, you know, as running under the yeah, old no, unit style and then just move over to the things that we need to up front. But they're they're a little bit risk averse uh, on that. But but yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean because that's one of those. And I, what I've even thought of is we actually have, we have a build server, actually two build servers, um, that we run uh, jobs uh, via Jenkins on. And what I thought would be really cool, because we actually have quite a few other servers that for the most part, for the most part sit idle. So what I'd like to do is see if I can figure out a way. See, and this is where I'd have to do, well, I, for Java, I wouldn't do MPI. I would do something you know, similar. Though. But I need a framework that lets me as the programmer figure this out, because what I need to do is I need to package up, you know, like, you know, here is the, the test case, and uh, here is the code that needs to be run, you know, and then here's the output you need to compare it to, and I've got, you know, probably, oh gosh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, right now I'm like, I'm not, I'm probably in the neighborhood of like 40 million ish cases that need to be run every time for like prior to release we have like a smaller smoke test that runs to like you know because obviously nobody wants to run a 23 hour unit test you know yeah. 40 million tests 23 hours that's yeah. amazing yeah so anyhow but so what i thought about would be really cool is we have like a bunch of quad core we're done yeah you can take back your uh your hdmi adapter for me but, uh, but yeah, you know, so I thought about it'd be cool because we got all these quad core servers if I could set something up where it was aware of my program. And